Greetings all, my name is Ken Esty, Chair of the Planning Commission here in the town of Newfane, and I'd like to welcome all of you who are on Zoom and all of you who are in our studio audience here at the town office of the town of Newfane. And so as this is a Planning Commission meeting, and it's a regular meeting of the Planning Commission of the town of Newfane here on Tuesday, no, Thursday, February 9th, and I'd like to uh, call this meeting to order. Uh, given that we do have quorum with uh, Jane, who is on Zoom, and uh, Kate Gehring, who is with us here on um, here at the uh, town office, and uh, myself. So I'll call this meeting to order at uh, 6.02 p.m. And thank you all for coming. And so uh, I'd like to go straight to uh, introductions, and uh, we might uh, Go, Kate, if you would go first. Sure. Are we introducing ourselves or introducing our speakers? <clears throat> uh, I think we'll go with the commission first oh. and then. I'm Kate Gehring. I'm a member of the Planning Commission. Jane? I'm Jane Douglas. I'm a member of the Planning Commission who was afraid to drive on ice. <laughs> there you go. And Max, if you might introduce yourself. You're on mute. Okay, good. Yes. There we Matt. go. Yes. Hi, everyone. So I'm joining just a moment late. I had a meeting for my daytime job. I'm Max Vanderfleet. I'm a new fan planning commission member. Great. Welcome. And um, so, yes. And now, if uh, Kate, if you might uh, take it from here and and ask for the introduction. Sure. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Hello, especially um, Bruce. And is Bruce on? I don't know, Paul and John, hello, and we'll introduce Juice Bruce when he joins. Um, this is the first of what we hope will be a few conversations about housing in Newfane and in the area and what we can do to um, support more of it and more affordable housing. Um, and we're super happy to have you both participating, or all three of you now, um, to talk about the loan and grant programs available to individuals here and um, sort of what, what Rockingham's doing. Uh, so we have tonight, I will, let's see, we have um, two speakers from the Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust, which is doing huge work in this area um, to support affordable housing. Um, Bruce Whitney, is Bruce here? Let's see, so we'll go, hey Paul. So Paul Margarano, who is the Multifamily Rental Improvement Program. I don't have your full, do you run the Multifamily <laughs> Um, rental Improvement Program and um, does work on the Vermont Housing Improvement Program um, and Bruce, uh, sorry, Bruce Whitney will also be joining us, I think, who run, is the Director of Homeownership at Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust and we have John Dunbar with us from the Rockingham Incremental Development Working Group, which I'm especially looking forward to hearing about. Thank you, John. Um, and also to add perspective from the Rockingham Planning Commission. Um, Paul, do you want to introduce yourself a bit more and, and talk a bit more about your programs and what you do to start. And you're on mute. There we go. Um, <clears throat> for some reason it didn't want to click off. Yeah, no, I'm Paul uh, Moderano with Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust. I'm the uh, multifamily rental program uh, coordinator. And um, so the, the Currently, there's a the major program we're running right now is the Vermont Housing Improvement Program, which uh, I don't know how, how much you want me to get into it, but I can get into that uh, after that, you know, introductions or whatever, and, you know, people want to know more about that. Um, there is other programs at Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust, and I could speak to them a little bit um, for primary residences and, and other loan programs, which are more income-based. Uh, programs, but if Bruce can't make it, I don't know. He, I didn't hear from him today, so I don't know if he can't make it or whatever, but I can answer most questions anyway. So. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, why don't we, John, do you want to introduce yourself quickly as well? And then Paul, if you would start by just telling us about those, your, the programs that you lead, and um, I think we may have some questions. That would be really great. Thank you all again for being here. Sure, um, John Dunbar, and uh, as you know, I'm a member of the Rockingham 
Planning Commission. I'm, my twin brother and I are also, we grew up in Bellows Falls, uh, Vermont, and uh, you know, brief stints um, out of town for college and uh, early careers. We moved back to the area uh, and have been been here for probably, uh, we're, we're both 50 years old now, so we probably have been back for at least 25 years. And um, we own uh, 16 uh, rental units um, spread across about uh, five buildings in Bellows Falls. We invest exclusively in Bellows Falls because that's where we grew up and we care about it. And we want to see uh, improved housing in town. We want to see improved buildings in town. We believe that Bellows Falls has a lot of potential. Um, so it's mostly about, um, I would say, doing well by doing good. Uh, just it's obviously a uh, something that we do in hopes of having some uh, retirement plan, but it's mostly about giving back for a community that provided uh, to us over the years. And Rockingham Incremental Development Working Group uh, became a part of that uh, group as a result of um, uh, the Vermont Council on Rural Development coming to Bellows Falls to do a program about three years ago that Putney is going through right now. Um, I'm not sure whether New Fane has or not, where they have come and they come and help you kind of decide where you want your town to go in the future. Um, unfortunately, that process was uh, right at the start of COVID. So we all got to meet uh, in a large group as a town and then COVID hit. And so it kind of really stalled things, but there was so much energy at those meetings that the Rockingham Incremental Development Working Group formed out of that. Um, just because there were a small group of people that really care about the town that could see the energy and said, hey, let's not let this energy die. Uh, let's figure out how to keep it going. So we did. And uh, it's been about three years and uh, I can talk more about that in a little bit. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think we'll, we'll let you each speak a bit. And if there are pressing questions as you all speak, we'll see if we can um, feel them. Folks in there will raise hands or raise your hands online. And then we'll loop back and um, let everyone ask all their questions again afterwards. Um, thanks again. Paul, you're up. Okay, so basically, um, the I'll just talk about the improvement uh, the rental uh, program there. The Vermont Housing Improvement Program is well, VHIP is basically a, um, there's a couple of purposes to it. It's funded, uh, initially it was called the Rapid Rehousing Program. Uh, it was funded through um, CARES Act stimulus package money that came into the state and down through the Department of Housing and Community Development. And uh, now the VHIP program is funded through the American Rescue Plan Act, also known as OPER. And uh, that's and that is um, <clears throat> the funding that we have now. So the federal money came down to the state through the Department of Housing and Community Development via the Agency of Community and uh, Commerce and Community Development. So the, the money's traveling around a little, but it's coming down into the communities. And uh, the main, there's a few main purposes. Uh, one of the main goals of the program is affordable housing. Uh, Part of the, uh, and I would say most of the uh, program is designed to house a specific uh, population, uh, generally people exiting homelessness. They try to give preference to leases to people that are trying to get out of homelessness. And that's mainly for new units and multifamily rentals. Um, if you have uh, re rehab units, if you want like a building with a couple of apartments and you rent them out, um, uh, the, so the, and you need a rehab, you can get up to uh, $30,000 per unit. Everybody is a, for all of these grants, grants, there is a 20% match, no matter which ones they are. So, uh, but there's 30,000 for rehab units and 50,000 if it's three bedroom. Uh, if you are creating new units, say from, um, you know, space, storage space, the gar you know, uh, well, the garages are a little different. Uh, storage space or old commercial conversions, you know, maybe some retail space that's sitting around and you want to do something with it and you want to convert it into uh, units. 
um, you can you can convert those and get fifty thousand dollars grants to do that. Now all of those come with the leasing requirements uh, that you have to give preference to uh, people exiting homelessness, and you would be working uh, New Fane. I would assume you'd be working with Groundworks uh, Collaborative, or um, if there's enough units, we you also there's also the potential to house. Uh, what they're trying to do is house refugees as well. So uh, if you can, in, in the refugee program, which comes through the state of Vermont is the, it's called the Ethiopian Community Development Program, uh, Community Development Council, I believe it is. And uh, they they uh, try to, they do what they try to set, what, they, what their name says, and they try to build communities. So if there's enough activity in, an, in a town, uh, then they try to get at least three or four families in that in that place that that can interact with each other when they get there. So they they really when they say community development, that's really what they're trying to do. Sort of found these refugee communities. And so those are the uh, that's the basic tenants. One of the other main parts of the program is is uh, accessory dwelling units, and everybody. Um, may not know what an accessory dwelling unit is. Accessory dwelling units, they were once known as uh, mother-in-law apartments or something like that. You know, it's basically, it's a primary residence. Sort of a definition from the state is, uh, if you have a primary single family, primary residence, that's key, uh, and you wanna build an apartment on it, you know, to, to rent out, uh, you, you can get a grant of, of $50,000, up to $50,000 uh, to do that. And the ADUs, because uh, you know it is in personal space, um, the consideration of leasing preference, the only requirement in the leasing of an ADU is that you uh, maintain um, HUD fair market rates, which I forgot to mention about the other one too. You have to use HUD fair market rate uh, cap on all units. Um, but you don't have to lease through the continuum of care or refugees if, if you don't choose to. A lot of, some people are uh, building units for workers in the area that, you know, like maybe teachers aides that are trying to stay in the area or, you know, they're trying to, you know, senior solutions is, is trying to house people in ADUs. And so there's people around that are building these ADUs for specific, their own specific purposes. I know we can have ideas, but, um, the issue that a lot of, you know, I can go answer questions, but that's basically the nutshell um, definition, I guess. If uh, people have questions, I should uh, let you ask away if you have to. I see there's a couple things in the chat, but I don't know if they're questions or. Can you, it looks like there were some questions about commercial <clears throat> uh, versus residential homeowners. John has addressed that, but. Um, are there other qualifications for who can apply for the grants? I'll build on that question. <laughs> no, it, well, any uh, in Vermont, the, the, the idea of the word commercial or residential, as is, is John's familiar with, is you have three units in a building, it's commercial. You know, So if you have an apartment with three units in it, it's considered commercial. But when I say commercial space, I mean, you can take space that's either, you know, uh, storage or, you know, people are converting like stores or retail space, or even uh, some, you know, it, it, people are like uh, warehouse space or uh, com other commercial buildings like that, and actually dividing them up and creating units. But uh, if you have an apartment building already and you have uninhabited, uh, you know, units that uh, you that can't really be rented because of their condition. Uh, then this is a good, you know, this is a good place to start looking for funding to help you out with that. So, um, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a, a homeowner could use the grant funding to update a section of their own home to add yeah. a rental unit in their home. So it can be a yep. an, an accessory dwelling unit within your home, or it can be a detached accessory dwelling yep. unit, or just creating a room and updating it, getting it up to code for it to be considered rental. So any of those would apply to these Well, the, the key is that they have to have their own, uh, it, the definition basically of this is, is that if you have a, a single family primary residence, 
Uh, you could build an accessory dwelling unit. It's on the deed, you know, if it's on the property, right? So it could be in a garage or barn or an attic, right? But the, but it has to be an independent subservient, uh, you know, basically a subservient entity to the main house, right? So the space uh, is limited to 30% of the square footage or 900 square feet, whichever is larger. Um, and, uh, and, and then it can, but it can be anywhere, but it has to have a kitchen and a bathroom. So like a, a room you can cut out and the, the most, um, you know, the, the most cost efficient ADU is if you have a large space, if you have a, a home that has three or four bedrooms in it and you're, you don't have, you know, kids to fill them anymore. Uh, you can you can cut that space out, and then you have your you know plumbing and your your septic is designed for the three or four bedrooms and things like that. So that's kind of where people with ADUs um, can run into some cost is if you you know you have a single family uh, residence and you want to add like put an addition on the house that's viable can be an ADU, but you're you 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 know the first question I ask people is. Uh, is is how, what your septic? You got to go to the town and find out. You know your your septic rules, right? Whatever your septic rules are, and you have to get your septic um, assessed to make sure that it can handle the extra fixture units or whatever. You know the uh, extra rooms. Thanks. I think Lynn's waiting to ask a question here. Hi, Paul. We've uh, had some conversations um, online. Um, so I've got some more now. Um, <laughs> so, so talking about uh, dividing a single family home. And um, so one question would be, if you divided a single family home, could you also have an additional ADU? And um, so we have, we have a house, as you said, we've got three extra bedrooms now, our kids moved out. Um, but we also have a bar, we also have a garage. So would all of those things qualify or would having two units in a single family home be um, disqualified for having another ADU? Well, that's actually, according to the state, an ADU is only one unit uh, added to the primary residence. Um, so I always have to defer to the state uh, some towns actually, they're, you know, people have presented me with permits from towns and they had, you know, go ahead and build two ADUs. But the definition from the state is that it's not an ADU anymore. So if you, uh, if, and it's really, uh, that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it becomes kind of a little tangled. But um, basically what happens at that point is then the rental, you can do it. And you, they would be considered new units, so you know, on the onset of it, you know. And so I would have to consider them new units, and and I mean, there's potential to petition that, you know, and, and but it's probably going to remain that it has to be one unit. And I, I would think you also need to be uh, question whether in the town zoning bylaws there are how many dwelling units per lot or per acre or however they define that. So making sure you qualify based on that. I, I think I'm good with that. Um, another thing is you, you mentioned market rates and uh, what are the rates when you talk market rates? I imagine if this is affordable housing, then it's a certain percentage of market rates. Yeah, it's the uh, it's the HUD fair market rates. They're can, so their government, um, you know, the HUD comes out with new numbers every year, and um, I mean this year they're up a little. I have that on the uh, on my website, or you can go to HUD uh, HUD's website and just look up HUD fair market rates, and and they'll and then you go to the page and choose your state, and then it'll give you. Uh, you can go by county. It goes by county, and you guys are Wyndham. So I go to I go look for fair market rates, and then I look for the state and the county. Yeah. Uh, and just to clarify, um, you were saying it has to be um, 
if you split uh, your single family home uh, to into two units, uh, the other unit, the other side can't be more than 30 percent or 900 square feet, whichever is larger. So you can go with 900 square feet. You have, you know, a 1,200 square foot house and you want to, you know, create a 400 square foot ADU, then, you know, that would be okay because it's less than 900. Okay, so, so I'm gonna... either or. So you can go with whatever is larger. So my house is 3,500 square feet. I could do an ADU yeah. 1,000 feet, 1,000 square feet. Uh, I believe you could, yeah, because you could go with the thirty percent. Yep. Okay. Because um, it says it says whatever is larger in the law. So. It's, I'm sorry. Say it again. That's the law says whichever is larger. Okay. I'm going by a statute on a. Uh, I actually have it here. In case I'm, he's interested. Uh, I could actually let me just pull it just to make sure that I'm not misleading. Does the unit does not exceed 30% of the total habitable floor space area of a single family dwelling or 900 square feet, whichever is greater. So the way I read that is that yes, you would be able to because okay. uh, uh, the, and, would be. the last thing I have, which is not um, number wise or dollar wise, it's uh, one of the things I ran into, I, I asked the contractor um, you know, could you give me an idea what this would cost? And he said, well, I need to know what the rules are as far as, you know, separating the houses and doing, you know, separating the building into two units. And um, where do I get help with that? Uh, well, I, the town, uh, the town should have, if the town has any kind of zoning or, or uh, zoning rules on how to um, divide housing and you know how you could do that most of the time that is generally based on uh setbacks uh acreage units per acre things like that you know no. but every every town is different so it's it's um yeah. it's, you know, that's a little bit uh, but i would go to the town first and then um basically you have to go through the department of fire safety also but once the town clears you for zoning, uh, generally the Department of Fire Safety will come in and check the structure and make sure, and they'll and they're the ones that'll give you the uh, any extras that you might have to do. That's that's what I needed to know. I I know I'm clear on everything. I'm on the DRB, so I understand what the rules are. But thank yep. you. We have a question. Yep. That that from Tom. Tom, do you want to um, turn on your mic and join in, or do you want us to read it? Let's see. Yeah. You might want us to read it. Okay. Well, we have a question about doesn't. Uh, here I am. Oh, go ahead. I, I was wondering if, if an ADU requires um, a separate and distinct entrance to the unit, or if you can. It can be entered once you're inside the primary home. Mm, that's a tricky question because the the house, the any any rental unit has to have uh, two egresses. You know, so it depends on the number of rooms because you know you have to have egresses from bedrooms and things like that according to uh, general fire safety codes. So um, if the entrance from the inside of the house, in fact, there is one that. Um, I'm doing and what they ended up doing uh, is is just there's a, there was a back room that they can't that you can come through so they created like a little entrance hall there so you can go into the house and then you can go upstairs into the attic at that at that doorway now that would have been through the house upstairs before so you there's a lot there's ways of doing it that aren't that expensive if depending on the on the you know the setup of the house um you know but there's there's ways of of finding a way around that one but you do have to have two egresses in the in the, each rental unit. yep right thanks yep um 
you know, since we don't have Bruce here, we may ask you to talk a little bit about the Green Mountain Home Repair, but I wondered if just quickly before you do that, could you give us the very short, like the nutshell version of how folks can um, initiate an application for the grants um, through VHIP or where to look yep. for that information? Well, there's two, actually, there's two applications now. Um, they separated the ADU uh, application out. So if you go to our main webpage, uh, homemattershere.org. Um, I could probably send you in. You, well, if you scroll across and look for Vermont Rental Rehabs, uh, you scroll across to that tab. And when you scroll over it, there'll be three drop down menus. And one of them will say uh, VHIP. Well, there's three of them. One will say VHIP uh, Rental Rehabs. The other one will say ADUs. And the other one will say Rockingham. Uh, we have, which is a separate program. So you go to, if you're going for an ADU, you go to that application. The application's there. There's some more information there. My information is there. Uh, contact information is there. Um, you can fill out an online application. I have a, I have a secure um, tab on that website that you can send me uh, all the documents through through there and through that, like it's like a, like a, what's that one called that everybody knows, Dropbox. It's kind of like a Dropbox, except it's our version of it. Um, and then if the, um, I'm updating the other page to that, and it's going to be, they'll be similar. Currently, the other page has a, a digital signature option, and that's really all it has. And so you got to go there and you apply online. The only problem that that has is that you got to be ready to fill out the whole application or else it disappears on you. Um, and that's why I'm taking it off of there and people just have to sign the documents or if you can't print and sign it, just send it to me and we'll get that signed. You know, I can send you a digital copy and you can sign it that way. But that's the best way to do it right there. Thanks. Are they, are they on a rolling basis? Is it sort of can, can one apply? Yeah, I'm still, still accepting applications. You know, the way the <laughs> federal government likes to give me a little bit of uh, keep me keep my blood flowing. But um, the, the the funds for the ARPA program, they 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 set it up so that it will be funded through 2025. And so the money is coming in through 2025 is provided the government stays open. Um, and so but and. I'm keeping the applications open and I'm and I'm waiting right now for a check from the state, which is on the way, because uh, I had to request more funding. We had to ask for uh, a number in the beginning and it wasn't, you know, so it's pretty popular program. But basically by, you know, you know, I'm keeping it open because sometimes it takes a while to get things going. Um, once you are eligible for VHIP, however, there is another grant for the ADUs. This is very helpful. A lot of times if you have to upgrade your septic, there's another one that another um, another grant that I can attach to the VHIP grant for uh, water and sewer. Um, so, it, and mostly I use that, that's a limited fund. Mostly I use that for people that can't do an ADU unless they get their septic upgraded or they have a, a well that's not going to be legal anymore. You know, a lot of people are like springs or dug wells, and the and I don't believe you can use a dug well on a rental. Kind of funny. Thank you, you can drink the water, but not your tenants, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, yep. So I don't know if John, you have experience with the program. If this is a good time for you to to pop in on this program, John, if that. Was Useful. Um, sure. And then Absolutely. Maybe to, talk to the the Green Mountain Home Repair, but since you have firsthand experience, it would be great if if you want to chime in here. Sure. Um, one of the properties that my twin brother and I have is um, it had been a three unit at some point. Um, two units were in um, you know were were rented. Uh, there was like a cottage in the back that was attached to the building that. Um, had been rented probably 10 or 15 years ago, but um, had been, uh, was deteriorating and it was to the point where no one could live in it. And so we were faced with either tearing it down so it wasn't a safety issue 
and you'll never recover that money that you spent to take it down or um, investing in the building, bringing it back online. And then over a long period of time, we would recoup that cost. Um, so we had made the decision uh, to, you know, to fix the building up. We essentially did a gut rehab. Uh, it was a approximately 900 square foot um, uh, apartment. Uh, it was to, uh, kind of a story and a half cape, if you will. Uh, and we ended up, um, you know, making it a one bedroom apartment. And we utilized the um, program, the predecessor to the VHIP program. So the, you know, at the beginning of COVID when it was the recovery housing uh, program and it was a $30,000 grant. I will say that the, you know, it, it, they've done a good job of making the barrier to entry into getting into these programs pretty easy. Um, the hardest part, is getting contractors to give you quotes. <laughs> um, I think is if you've had to hire a contractor in the last three years, you've discovered that. So, you know, obviously you're going to need to, you know, prepare a budget for these programs so that, um, you know, Paul would know, you know, how much is this project going to be, and you know, uh, also uh, how do you plan to to do the twenty percent um, uh, match. Uh, so, and that can be work that you do on your own, which was the case, uh, my case, um, where we did a lot of labor that we could provide. Um, we did that ourselves and, and I'll, uh, the project, uh, I'll let you know that the project that we actually did was more about $120,000. We used a $30,000 grant, uh, just to help cover a uh, gap in funding that, that we had, um, so the other thing that I would let people know is that you should plan for that grant money to be taxable income. So um, make sure that you understand that going in, that if you take 30,000 or 50,000 uh, grant, you would need to claim that as personal income and be prepared for that um, the tax on that. Uh, but all in all, it was a great, it's a great program. I think it uh, allows people to, um, you know, that want to provide housing and see some of the costs of that. And that can be um, prohibitive in many, uh, many cases, but also this may even allow you to do something a little bit nicer than you would do if you had to fund the whole thing on your own. So it'll, it may allow you to do all kinds of things that, um, you know, may be challenging. Uh, we, we were able to make it an all electric house, all electric unit. So there's air source heat pumps. Um, it had all new insulation. Um, so it's, it's uh, I think it's a great showcase of what the program can do. That's great, thank you. Um, since we don't have other questions here, maybe we'll bounce back quickly to you, Paul. Um, to, if you don't mind giving us at least just a little overview of the, Green Mount, it's the Green Mountain Home Repair Program. It sounds like that ties in with this. And then John, we'll, we'll point the mic back at you and hear a little more about um, what you're doing in Rockingham overall. Yeah, <clears throat> the, um, those are really good points uh, John brought up too. I and mean, they did a really great job on that unit too. And I hope it's holding up and, uh, and working out definitely. Um, but the Green Mountain Home Repair Program is a little bit different. It's, it's um, mostly uh, loans, uh, mostly for, you know, it's primary it's single families. Um, and they up to, I think you can have up to four, like it can be, a, like you can, you have to be living there, but you can have other, if you have an owner occupied building of up to four uh, units. Um, those are also covered. The there is uh, because it's U.S. It's not USDA. I think it's HUD funded. Um, there are some uh, income guidelines. Mostly everything that um, HUD does is, is the big magic number is 80% area median income, and I believe that's uh, you know based on your income. Though there are different levels of interest rates and different types of. Uh, things that they can do for you, you know, like I think, I believe there's some deferred loans, but the key to that program is that it's mainly for 
uh, people that are living in their home, you know, so you have to, it has to be a primary residence. It's not really, I mean, you can use it to, you can take the money to, uh, you know, fix the roof on a four, four unit building or even upgrade some of the, you know, the tenants, you know, the, the leased units, but uh, it is uh, loans mainly. And that also, that's also at that website, but it's uh, not the rental rehab part. If you go to that homeladdershere.org that John put up, uh, the, it's look for the home repair tab. And there's two, there's an application, and but there's also a page that I think describes that program a little. Another thing I wanted to say, uh, it, it, John reminded me of this, um, is that if you have a unit now, say you have a, home with a rental unit in it now but uh you're or you have a rental house now you can also use the vhip money for um if you provide you have a vacant unit that you can enter into the program you can also uh get a grant for like exterior so like so if somebody has a rental unit and they have a vacant unit that's up to code um they can get the money for like the roof or siding or you know other other things like that so you can actually uh and then you have to covenant one of the units into the program that's the other part i probably should mention is that there is a covenant i don't think i said anything about the covenant now that i mentioned the word there is a grant agreement and a covenant and that is a basically a five-year uh, commitment to the program, basically. And uh, so after five years, then you don't have children. Sorry, the, the five year, that's for the loan program or for the... Um... No, that's for the... I'm sorry, I mixed them up a little. I, I apologize for that. But um, the this five year commitment is for the VHIP program. The, so the loan... I forgot to mention that earlier, but when I thought about covenants, the um the, the Green Mountain Home Repair does not have uh it's it's mainly like I said it's mainly a loan program. There is like an emergency fund that people can tap into, but um, everything is income guided in that program. So if you're, I mean, I think I believe you have to be relatively low income to get a grant, straight up grant for that program. From that program, but um, the the if people are in a home that needs repair, they do lend money to repair. Um, at this moment, anyway, they are still lending money to repair uh, mobile homes, uh, which is probably one of the few um, places you can get money to repair a mobile home. Uh, that's probably one of the big ones. But um, you know, people can use that money for anything. Uh, wells. Uh, if you have any trouble with your personal well or, you know, roof is leaking or generally what will happen, you fill out an application, uh, a home specialist will come out to the house and look around and, you know, check it and they, you know, don't really do a home inspection, but they'll go around and look at the wiring and see if there's any safety issues that stand out and uh, and they try to, you know, they try to work with you to to get your home up to health and safety uh, code, I guess, but they don't actually go to the code all the time, but they try. I think, yeah, Kenneth, do we have other questions in the room? You have another question. I have another question. Um, so the, so the uh, five-year commitment uh, and I think that's looking at the program where you separate a uh, single family dwelling. Um, <clears throat> is there any restriction that after, say, two years, you couldn't rent the other side at fair market? Um, that's a good question. I, I think that at that point, that what you would end up having to do if you decide to move out and it would not be your primary residence anymore, um, I think both units would become rentals, but you would end up having to, uh, once we, once you sign one lease, then we turn the, we turn your application over to the the Department of Housing and Community Development, you got a crime, you know, you get a contact up there. And so it, things like that, then you would end up going through them. 
that in this part of the covenant does say if there's any changes in the situation, you know, right. that you have to notify them. And then at that point, I, I thought they were going to put something in the wording that uh, you can, this is talk now, not valid yet, but uh, that they, they, I think there was talk of trying to get people, give people the opportunity to, to buy down the grant, you know, at like 20% a year, like if you sold it and a house or something like that, the owner can do that now, but with ADUs, it's kind of new. And, um, and and there's there's legislation going on right now in in um, in the House and Senate, I think actually, uh, um, to to sort of try to state fund this program and uh, and see how they can change some of the, the rules now. And you know, in June, I'm suspecting there'll be uh, some other rules um, and guidelines for people to be utilized or not, you know. So. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Paul. Um, I feel like we could um, keep on with asking you questions about the programs for quite a while, but I want to make sure we have time to hear also about um, the, what's happening in Rockingham, um, the incremental, incremental development working group there, and I am especially here, curious, excuse me, to hear a little bit about what the Planning Commission is doing there as well, um, if you would, John. Sure. Um, so, you know, as I said, the Rockingham Incremental Development Working Group, you know, formed out of that larger um, town-wide process with the Vermont Council on Rural Development. And, you know, really what we did was, it, you know, uh, it started with just a few people that wanted to keep the energy going. And we reached out to various stakeholders. So um, those could be local bankers, um, local shop owners, local business owners, um, local contractors, uh, you know, anybody that had an interest in housing in your town, um, in development in your town in general, it didn't have to be just housing. Um, you know, and I think housing, as in the case of most towns, that's the hot, hot button right now. That's what everybody's trying to figure out. And so, you know, that is just a topic that kind of moved its way up. But, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that we've discussed as a group in terms of how to, um, how to move things forward. And really the, you know, the um, thought process behind it is, particularly with housing, um, you know, you can wait around for a developer to come in and build 20 housing units if you're wanting to add 20 house housing units in your town. Um, and at, you know, five to $10 million, uh, it's going to take a while before um, any developer is going to come forward and do that. Um, and you may wait forever for that. And so, but as we're talking tonight about the program that Paul's um, presenting, you know, we as individual townspeople can add 20 units of housing much faster, much more efficiently than a large developer needing to develop a piece of land. Um, so, uh, and that type of, change, that incremental change is much longer lasting than one big project coming into town. Um, and typically that's, you know, the big project is the big shiny thing that happens and everybody's, uh, you know, excited about it at the start, but it may not necessarily be as long lasting or as, um, bring as much vibrancy to the town as many small things can do over time. Uh, so that's really uh, how it came to be. Um, and we continually, uh, we meet uh, about once a month. And some of those, some of our activities um, have been looking at some small projects around town that can happen. And that could be 
you know, beautification projects. It could be, uh, you know, uh, dressing up a, a park or um, planting trees or painting uh, bike lanes or anything like that. Those are all, uh, you know, several ideas of things that could happen from a rocking and incremental or from an incremental standpoint. But uh, as of late, you know, Rockingham's going through a rewriting of the town plan. Um, and you guys know how much, uh, how much work that takes. Um, and you're presenting that to the select board. Um, and Rockingham actually has uh, three governments. There's the Rockingham Select Board, there's the Bellows Falls Village Trustees, and then there's the Saxon River Village Trustees. Um, and so they're all uh, included in that. And for the last several months, we've really been trying to be an informational resource. So we're going to programs throughout the state, participating in things throughout the state and gathering information that we then present to the various boards um, because without that information, they, might, they may not find that information unless they are out seeking it. So for the last several um, months, we've been more of an educational resource, um, bringing things like the, um, the state's uh, housing needs assessment, uh, which is broken down into the county by county. And then we actually went a step further and contacted uh, the from my housing finance agency who put together the the um, the study to break it down into just Rockingham. And so we were able to take data that has been collected from the census and provide it to the various uh, boards to say, here's here's the issue that we have. And now we got to figure out how to solve it. Um, all too often, I think, and in, in you may have experience where you're sitting in a meeting with a, a, a group and People will say, "Well, that's not here. That's not Newfane. That's Burlington. That's Chittenden County. You know, they don't. Ha we don't have the same issues that they have." Well, you can take a look at some of those uh, studies that have been done, and dig into the dig into the data, and you will quickly find out that we are not immune to any of the um, concerns that are happening in other parts of the state. So, um, we just tend to read about it in the newspapers uh, or on media more when it's around. Uh, Chittenden County. So, um, so I, you know, I think what I would uh, stress to this group is that find the people that um, are really energetic about new fame and about um, bringing new fame forward in the future, and get those people together. Figure out who else should be part of the discussion find out who the stakeholders are. Um, and that energy, once you capture that energy, it really is just trying to keep that energy going. And and the, the direction of your group can and probably should shift as the needs shift. Um, so, you know, we, we went through a little period where it's like, you know, there's so many things that we can do and, and should do, but how do we direct our focus uh, on something short term, you know, in the next several months? And then how do we move that to something further along in the future, uh, looking down the road a few years? Thank you. That is- uh, Any questions about, yeah. Questions here? So, you know, really it, um, what I'd also, would encourage uh, you if you develop a group like this, there really should be one person that is, you know, kind of the, the person that is scheduling the meetings, uh, kind of gathering all the info and, and keeping everybody updated. Uh, and then, um, you know, meeting once a month is ideal, I think. Um, I don't think you want to go too much longer and you don't want to, you know, we're all in enough meetings. We don't need to have too many of them. Um, but you want to have enough that you are able to continue uh, addressing some of the items that you want to. Uh, it helps. Um, you know, we found that it was better to meet in person when we could. So oftentimes we were meeting outside at the um, Waypoint Center in Bellows Falls. 
uh, weather permit, you know, find an area that's under cover, but still could be open air if there's concerns about um, COVID or things like that. Um, but face-to-face -face, uh, was always really helpful. The other thing we did was we invited speakers. It could be, um, you know, people from the various state agencies to come in and help us discuss some of the issues uh, surrounding our town. So um, yeah, those are, those are all things that I would encourage you to do. Thank you. Um, I think that is inspiring for many of us listening and um, really helpful to hear and to hear that experience of supporting development at a kind of smaller scale. Um, if you don't mind, while we have a few more minutes, um, I think we'd love to hear as well a little bit about the, the approach of the Rockingham Planning Commission. And it sounds like you that's a different hat for you than the incremental development working group. And um, especially for those of us who are interested in functioning yeah. in different roles, you know, how you, what, what you do and how they work together. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, I, I think I came on board in the, on the planning commission in 2021, I believe. Um, and sort of right at the start of re rewriting the town plan, um, and, you know, I think what was eye-opening to me early on was sort of a, um, I don't want to say a negative viewpoint on, um, you know, rental housing, but certainly there was some, uh, some focus on trying to limit uh limit the number of housing units in a building you know there were certainly were cases uh in bellows falls where you know one of the large um i'll say mansions one of these large older homes on you know main street one of the main streets in in bellows falls uh had been turned into 11 rental units 11 one bedroom units um and really the issue was about how they were designed. It was, you know, it, that it wasn't well designed. It wasn't, wasn't well thought out how to uh, have these 11 units in the building that made it an appealing uh, place to be. Um, so there was some interest in kind of using density to uh, eliminate the ability for someone to do that. Um, and, but it quickly, you know, I think with COVID and the housing crisis um, and the fact that, you know, we're unique uh, or unique compared to Newfane, we have uh, the infrastructure, which I'm sure Newfane wishes they had town water, town sewer um, all over, you know. Um, so we have that. Uh, we, in the town, the, Sewer treatment facility is probably at 30% of the capacity. Um, so we have capacity to build more. Um, so, you know, really it's been a, a kind of a focus to see how we can um, rewrite the town plan and our zoning bylaws to encourage development in our village, in our downtown where you have all the infrastructure and not push people to uh, develop outside of our village where now they're gonna have to pay more to travel. Um, the town's gonna be paying more to maintain the roads and provide the infrastructure out there. Um, so, um, you know, really it's been taking a look at how our, how our villages were, how our town and village was, you know, was developed hundreds of years ago. And when, we all had small lots and houses were close together and many houses were, had multi-generational or multi-families uh, living in the building. So kind of getting back to that um, and doing it in a way that um, is, um, you know, is smart and provides better housing, provides good housing and provides, uh, and people with the ability to live in a walkable town and not have the expense of uh, cars and needing to get in your car to go everywhere. That sounds great. <laughs> 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 um, 
the change, the zoning changes that you've made, I'll, I'll, um, have, have there been pushback or are folks on board or, you know, is there, is there sort of a conversation or a debate or is it just like you're figuring out how to yeah. do it? I think with anything, there's there's always some debate. There's always, you know, a little bit of pushback. But I, um, you know, and I, I would say that we haven't, you know, the new town plan has not been adopted yet by the um, select board. So we're finishing, uh, we've pretty much finished the draft of each chapter. And now we're uh, putting it into its final form and we'll present it to the select board. Uh, but we did take some, you know, some of the major chapters like housing being one and presented it to uh, members of the various uh, boards and, um, you know, just for early feedback. And there, there certainly was some, some pushback. I mean, I think that reality and perception can oftentimes be different. So, you know, uh, and I think that people uh, tend to think, well, if we're going to increase density, that means that there's going to be that many more people coming into your town. And that's not necessarily true. It's not, you know, if you take a, a you know, two unit building or a one a single family household, and you turn it into a duplex, that doesn't mean that you're automatically bringing someone in from outside. Um, you know, certainly what we have found and what the, um, what the housing needs assessment shows is that Vermont and Wyndham County in particular has so many large multi-bedroom homes and many of them have one person or one couple living in those homes. Um, so we have such a shortage of one bedroom or right sized living, you know, so there are very, very few units that are, you know, less than 800 square feet or less than a thousand square feet. We have, you know, there's many examples of people living in 2000, 3000, 4000 square foot homes um, and it's just one household. So, um, so some pushback on, on that. Uh, I think that when they start, when you start having the discussion, they start seeing the needs that are out there. Um, and the fact that if there's in the state, I think there were like, uh, 50,000, uh, you know, roughly 50,000 one bedroom housing units, but there were 160,000 families looking for one bedroom or 160,000 residents looking for a one bedroom. So huge shortage. And then on the flip side, you have, you know, 120,000 five bedroom homes and, you know, only 18,000 families actually looking for a five bedroom home. So uh, oversupply in that respect and undersupply in the others. So, um, you know, I think that it's, we're at a critical point in the housing shortage and, you know, some, uh, definitely some things need to change and, uh, as Paul mentioned, there's some things happening in the legislature uh, that, you know, certainly there will be some things about if your town has water, sewer, uh, then, you know, you can't be forcing people uh, to build outside by restricting, um, you know, within reason, minimum lot sizes, things like that. Thank you so much, John. That's sure. um, interesting and uh, I think super helpful for us. I think we might have questions. Um, Jane, is that a hand? Yeah, I, I wondered if someone could talk to uh, examples of things in the zoning bylaws that should be changed, like the number of parking spaces required per unit or absolutely, um, you know, with shared driveways, things like that. What are some things that we should be looking in our own zoning bylaws to change in order to encourage yeah. more dense housing in the village? Yeah, definitely. Um, the parking, um, I you know, I think there's a, there's a movement in uh, in Montpelier to maybe restrict it to you can't, you know, just one vehicle per housing unit, but there are many towns and, and municipalities that are actually eliminating any parking. Um, you know, so uh, I just looking at the 
you know, as I said, I have 16 uh, rental units. We just uh, purchased two more rental units. So the 14 that we currently have online, um, I would say probably less than half of them have vehicles or maybe half have vehicles. So there are a lot of people that do not have vehicles. And particularly, you know, I would 50% of our rental units are people that are on subsidies. Um, and they, you know, many of them can't afford a car or for various reasons can't have a car. So um, I think having requiring parking for those housing units um, is seems silly, particularly when there is on street parking um, on everywhere that we own a building, um, but Bellows Falls currently doesn't uh, count the off street, or sorry, on street parking. Um, and we tend to have, in Vermont, we tend to have, um, we feel like the streets should be clear for plowing, uh, but certainly there are some major cities that have figured out how to plow, um, you know, during snowstorms. And so trying to figure out how a small town can figure out uh, uh, how to have year round on street parking, um, to help with housing would, would be good. The other thing that I would say regarding uh, density and, and other um, dimensional uh, regulations, I, you know, the, the setbacks um, and height requirements, I think those are going to already kind of limit the density, like how many housing units you can have on that lot. So I uh, I have a sense that by saying you can only have three housing units per 1,500 square feet of, uh, of lot area is, is redundant in a sense when you start thinking about, well, if the lot is 50 by 100, and you have 15 foot setbacks on the side and 20 in the front and 10 in the rear or something like that, you've already severely limited um, and you have a height requirement of 35 feet. You've already um, limited density on that lot just from the setback requirements. Adding a so many square feet, you know, so many uh, housing units per square foot just adds another measure that doesn't seem ideal. So I would just encourage you to look at that as to whether you need um, to add a, a density restriction when there's already some dimensional restrictions. I, I know also, I've talked to some people who are debating um, adding rental property on on their to their house and adding a you know little apartment of the garage or whatever, but they're very worried about the fact that if you get a lousy tenant in there, it's virtually impossible to get rid of them. I mean, is there any action? I know the something's going on at the state. I think about you know what is it no limiting little little landlord? Yeah, the landlord has has no right to evict people. Uh, you know yeah. versus. Yeah, yeah, I you know, that's that always will, a conundrum. Yeah, I think that people will, uh, or, you know, there is a difference between an owner occupied, um, you know, rental. Uh, so if you have an ADU, something above your garage, I think that they will treat that differently if they do come out with um, kind of no cause eviction uh, policies uh, versus just a, you know, uh, complete multifamily that doesn't have the owner of the building actually living in the residence. Um, you know, I've, we've been fortunate that we haven't had to uh, do very many evictions. We have had to do um, some, um, and, but I haven't found it to be, you know, you certainly have to, may have to end up hiring an attorney and go through that process, which can mean a few thousands of dollars. Um, but you could also have tenants that destroy your, you know, the property and then you have all of that maintenance. But um, haven't really, I think it, the most important piece is your, uh, the process of, uh, screening tenants. And just if you do a good job screening tenants, um, then you have drastically reduced uh, that uh, 
um, that potential. Yeah, just to add on to what John's saying about the screening aspect is that is really in Vermont, there's, you know, that is where they have a lot of rights, you know, as a property owner, you know, you can screen people out. And, and as he said, with the owner occupied, I believe there is some sort of, a, a, there's a different differential in the, the ability to get a troubling, a troubling uh, rental situation resolved in a court um, if you are owner occupied as well. But, um, but, you know, that I, you know, there's always that risk, you know, of course, and, uh, but it's, it's, uh, and they, they say, you know, people, uh, <laughs> I do hear lots of different stories, you know, but I, I think that the, um, if you're going to do it, uh, you, that is definitely a consideration, you know, for sure. And uh, you you want to be sure that this is what you, you want to do. And But I think an owner-occupied situation is a lot different even on, in, at the social level, you know, with, with the tenant, you know, you can screen it and you're there, you know, and uh, as, the, as a, you know, it's not like you're, you know, if you own 17 or 20, you know, buildings, you're not going to be at each one of them, you know every day and so there's no you know you don't have that that back and forth with the tenant you don't know what's going on in, in in the units all the time you know you hear things and you can go and respond to them but if you're there you're 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 on the scene so i think that the situation with a with like a single unit infill kind of thing like an accessory dwelling unit or one unit or two units in a house that you live in owner occupied is going to be a much different situation um you know, but it's definitely worth considering because you never know, you know, you just can't tell, um, you know, what the future is going to hold. And, uh, you know, not everybody is honest when you meet them either. So, but that's definitely, a, you know, a good consideration. But I think it's, you know, you know, the, there's, there's a, the, the C, Covio, the C O V E O um, has a landlord uh, tenant relations handbook, actually. Um, have you ever seen that, John, or or not? I don't know, but I, I think it's uh, the Champlain. What do you the C O V O? What does that actually stand for? Champlain. Yeah, it might be C V O Champlain Valley. I don't know, but it's uh, I can look it up and and put it in the chat. But they have uh, they have some. Uh, some guides for people to look at. What are your rights as a landlord? What are your rights as a tenant? You know, and so you can read that book. I'll, I'll before I head out, I can send that or I can send that to Kate and she can put it in the, um, the report that she sends out or the notes in this for this meeting. Because uh, I have to go dig that up. But. Sure, yeah, we this is being recorded so everyone can um, watch it again and we will, um, we have notes and we'll make copies and can circulate all the super helpful information in the chat as well. Um, one more question. Okay, we're, yeah, one, one last quick question or Wait, one quick question. question. <laughs> for for yeah. Paul, um, I, when I was reading through some of the materials and maybe I misunderstood, but there was something about the grant was only going to be, a grant was only going to be given if the unit had to be gutted. And did I misunderstand that? Uh, yeah, no, it doesn't have to be gutted, uh, it, but it has to be for the rental units. They have to be vacant. Uh, generally, if it, well, if you're rehabbing an ADU, it would have to be vacant too, I suppose. But uh, it doesn't have to be gutted. You can people have done just you know taken you know plastered up walls and painted and put new you know floors down and stuff like that. Uh, add you know when you when you do rent, there's rules. You know some. I had someone that went through their units and put in new hardwired smoke detector, you know, things like that. So you can't any kind of, you know, as long as it's vacant, the vacancy requirement is uh, written into the statute. And uh, and so they, uh, they definitely, uh, that's definitely one of the things that you have to, you have to, uh, that's a strict guide is that it has to be vacant for 90 days. Thank you. 
Um, any last quick questions from the Zoom gallery? Awesome. Well, I think we're right on schedule. Thank you so much, uh, John and Paul. This is interesting and fantastically helpful for a lot of us individually and very useful for us as a planning commission. Um, we really appreciate your time um, and generosity being here and sharing all this information. I just shared that, uh, a link to that booklet too, actually, in the chat. So. Oh, great, thank you. Um, um, we'll figure out how to consolidate this all and get this information to everybody who wants it. We'll circulate it to planning commission members and anyone else is welcome to email and we'll send you all this information and the BCTV link uh, once we have it. Oh, God. can I just throw one more plug in there for someone else? The, uh, the Brattleboro area affordable housing uh, people, they have a program where they try to, they help people out with, um, with ADUs in, in particular. And I just put a link to their, to their, their website in there too. And you can look up there that, that link there is actually particularly for the ADU page. Uh, it's the Brattleboro area affordable housing is the name of them. And they're a nonprofit organization down in Brattleboro, but they do work in Wyndham. I believe they'll go all up to New Fane, I'm sure. And uh, I know they go to Rockingham. Um, okay. Wyndham, so there's just a couple extra links for you. Stay around on the internet. Thank you. You know what to do. <laughs> You're welcome. Keep us Thank busy. you for inviting me. Have a good we night. Appreciate it. All right, well, thank you very much, all. Thank you. Really appreciate it, yes. Welcome. Yeah, so uh, good to meet you both, and, and yes, with great appreciation for uh, reaching across the towns and uh, assisting us here in Newfane. So, and we had this recorded with BCTV, so certainly the word will get out. And Kate, way to go. Thank you so much for all the work you did to pull on and call together with us and everyone here. So, okay, so what we'll do then, if there are no other, um, anything else, we're going to uh, take a pause and uh, uh, then go into the rest of our planning commission. So um, everyone feel free to stay, but we're going to uh, just, as I say, take a break um, and then move into our other, other business. So, okay. all right, well, all the best to, to you all. Have fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. See you later. Good night.